The UK regulator confirms a likely link between the AstraZeneca vaccine and extremely rare blood clots. The prosecution in the George Floyd trial runs into all sorts of problems, raising the possibility of an explosive ending, and backlash sinks the early plans of the people who plan to dim the sun in order to cool the planet. My name's Malin Baker, this is The Malin Baker Show. For the next couple of days, the news in the UK will be dominated by the passing of the Duke of Edinburgh, husband of the Queen, which was announced today. For a good part of a week before that point, the news in the UK has been about blood clots, specifically the AstraZeneca vaccine and blood clots. The UK regulator, having studied case reports in the UK, has finally confirmed that the statistically rare but detectable incidences noted in Denmark and Germany are similarly detectable in the UK, in contradiction to earlier messaging implying the opposite. The level of the risk remains incredibly low, and I mean vanishingly small. Around one in a quarter million chance that if you have the vaccine, you'll develop blood clots. Around a one in a million chance that you would die from it. So let's put that perspective in some other figures. Do you know what else would give you blood clots? Well, catching COVID-19 for one thing. There is such a strong association between blood clots and having serious COVID-19 that a study published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery in January suggested that early medication against blood clots should be given to all admitted COVID patients. What else? Well, a nasty type of blood clotting called deep vein thrombosis is a risk if you're taking long haul flights and you don't move around much en route. Something like 1.65 per million passengers on long haul flights may suffer, which is in the same ballpark as the risk of blood clots from the AstraZeneca vaccine. And this is meaningful to me. My father died because of exactly this some years ago, after he'd returned recently from Australia. Very unlikely events happen to real people all the time. Did that stop me from taking long-haul flights? Of course not. I do make sure I move round a bit when I do, but that's it. And it's widely known amongst the population that it's a risk of long-haul flights. Does it ever stop people taking such flights? No. The risks are way, way higher every time you get in your car to take a drive. Does that higher risk stop people from driving? No. Birth control pills have got significantly greater risk of causing blood clots. Does that stop people from... Well, you get the idea. There are known risks that we discount because the benefits outweigh them. However, as I've said numerous times, as a species, we are spectacularly bad at evaluating risk. And one of the frequent things that we do is we overrate risks that we hear a lot about. Putting an issue on the front pages of the newspapers for days in a row, that would do it. Now, there does, of course, have to be transparency. But when the evidence first came out talking about the risk to long-haul flyers of deep vein thrombosis, did that get splashed over the front page for days in a row? No, it did not. Such problems would probably be on page 8 or page 9, not quite with the shaggy dog stories, but not far off. That's not how we're doing anything in relation to COVID. So firstly, the EU amplified talk on this topic, apparently in response to vaccine boasting by Brexiteers. And that led political leaders in the EU to provoke alarm and vaccine reluctance in their own populations that had significant consequences there. And then because of their overreaction, UK regulators have been issuing reassurance. And now that it's confirmed that there is an issue, they're left trying to explain it in the proper context, even while splashing it over all the front pages and holding special press conferences, the profile of which conveys the exact opposite message to that of there's nothing to see here. If it had just come to light without Europe going all precautionary principle over it, then it could have been communicated in context. But at this point, they probably don't see an alternative way to do it. As the collected conspiracy theorists of YouTube will tell you, if you seem to be trying to cover something up, that would make it a whole lot worse. Luckily, the UK has already vaccinated the majority of people currently at risk. And so the numbers of people dying in hospitals is still going down significantly. And a new poll today suggests that trust in the AstraZeneca vaccine is holding up in spite of all this, at around 75%, down just two percentage points. 
probably because people conceive a potential for life returning to normal and they know why it's happening here and it's not yet happening in Europe. Indeed, University College London announced that the number of people with protection through either vaccination or previous infection will hit 73.4% on April the 12th. Why is that significant? Because that is enough, they suggest, to tip the country into herd immunity. Which sounds fantastic, but then it depends on who you believe, because Imperial College released modelling this week saying that there was just 34% protection by the end of March. You might think, I couldn't possibly comment, but you might think that such a stark disparity would suggest that at least one group, possibly both, have no idea what they're talking about. According to the Office for National Statistics, by the week ending March 14th, around 54% of people in England had antibodies to the virus, slightly less than that in the other nations of the UK. Since then, the Telegraph reports that another 7.1 million people have received a first dose of vaccine, nearly 100,000 have tested positive for the virus. So it's hard to see how those Imperial College numbers get arrived at. It described them as pessimistic but plausible. Well, we'll see. As always, we look to the data without presumptions. Elsewhere, they don't have the luxury of such speculation. Brazil is now seeing days of over 4,000 deaths and rising, with many of its hospitals setting up overflow mortuaries. And the worrying thing here, as I've mentioned before, is that for some reason, the number of 18 to 45 year olds who are dying in intensive care nearly tripled over the last four months. In India, there's been a surge in infections made worse by the country's floundering vaccine programme, in spite of the country being the largest manufacturer of vaccine in the world and putting in place an export ban, meaning that none of that is getting sent anywhere else. The Times of London suggested that the numbers there could be attributed to a collapse in public tolerance for restrictions, with Indians now attending huge religious gatherings, political rallies, weddings, even cricket matches. Meanwhile, the EU is continuing to struggle. EU health ministers this week failed to get agreement on a coordinated approach. According to diplomats, the meeting was exasperating and no consensus was possible. Italy and Spain have moved to restrict the AstraZeneca jab to the over 60s. Belgium and France are going for the over 55s. Finland and Sweden are robustly opting for 65. Germany is suggesting that under 60s who've already had a first dose of AstraZeneca should now get a different vaccine for their second dose, although the last I heard all the blood clotting incidents were associated with first doses. Denmark is the ultimate vaccine snowflake, opting not to use the vaccine at all, although to be fair, that said, Denmark currently has very low rates of deaths and cases compared to some of the other EU countries, so that probably changes their perspectives as well. Now, in a minute, we'll look at the rest of the news. But first, one piece of news that you might have missed this week is that the parliamentary election in Greenland just happened. Who cares, you might ask, except, of course, for the good people of Greenland. Well, the Chinese probably care. A Chinese-backed mining project in Greenland for rare earth metals now faces cancellation because the party that won the election is opposed to it. Rare earth metals, as you probably know, have an essential role in modern technology of all sorts. China's dominance in sources of rare earth metals is seen as a key strategic weakness for the Western countries whose societies are heavily dependent on those technologies. In 2019, it was estimated that China owns between 90 to 95 percent of supply, giving the CCP the ability to stop electronics manufacturing anywhere in the world, should it choose. And we've seen this in action already. In 2010, a dispute over a clash next to some disputed islands led the Chinese to restrict the export of rare earth minerals to Japan, a block that lasted for a couple of months. But China is running up against constraints in its domestic mines, hence its interest in securing sources in other parts of the world. The US and others have an interest, obviously as well, in securing major sources that are not vulnerable to the whims of autocratic governments. If you wondered why President Trump offered to buy Greenland two years ago, well now you know. So Greenland has become a political football and unnoticed by most of us, a desperate power grab is being played out between the powers pretty much worldwide, wherever there may be those sources of crucial minerals. 
We've seen Apple this week talking about a shortage of microchip for its computers and its iPads caused by shutdowns relating to the pandemic. Nothing to do with rare earth minerals, but it's an indicator of how a number of crucial things that we take for granted can turn out to be vulnerable to interruptions in supply. What is the situation with rare earth minerals? How are the power politics playing out? And how vulnerable are our societies to an extended interruption? Are we even in danger of outgrowing the supply even if everything goes right? I will be looking at all of that in the video due to go live at 7pm UK time on Monday next week. See you there. In the US, the George Floyd murder trial has been continuing and the nightmare scenario continues to unfold. Namely, one group continues to hold that the trial is a referendum on America, that if Chauvin gets off, then that could only be because of systemic racism. Meanwhile, the prosecution's case against Derek Chauvin has been hitting a lot of road bumps. And it's entirely likely that the standard of reasonable doubt will be met in the defence's favour. So this week it was prosecution witnesses. And at this point it's meant to be all going the way of the prosecution as they make their case. But that's not quite how it's been going. Instead you've had expert witnesses agreeing with the defence that from different body cam shops it looks like Chauvin's knee was on Floyd's upper back, not on his neck, which is how that hold is trained. You've had a use of force expert agreeing that he himself had used such a hold on suspects in the past and kept them in that hold until support arrived. You've had medical experts agreeing that asphyxia, the cause of death for Floyd, is also commonly a cause of death arising from drug use and specifically the drugs that Floyd had in his bloodstream. You've seen the footage showing George Floyd saying that he couldn't breathe when he was still in the squad car before Chauvin was doing anything to him. You've had the police expert agree that suspects will often fake sickness in order to try to avoid the process of arrest, so not taking someone at their word would be natural for a police officer faced with that situation. One prosecution witness's evidence was so unhelpful to the prosecution that the defence have said that they want to call her back as a defence witness. Now, it's not all going one way. There was a long line of police officers testifying that what Chauvin did was outside the norm and unacceptable. And other evidence suggesting that the impact of drugs would not have matched Floyd's behaviour prior to his death. But remember, once again, all you need to establish is reasonable doubt. And given the exact requirement of each of the three charges, it seems that there would be a very strong case for reasonable doubt for all of them. You don't have to like Derek Chauvin. You don't have to wish him well. This is about due process and having to prove specific charges. The defence is currently putting a very good case forward. Now, if you read the New York Times or you watch CNN, you're getting a totally different take on this, where the only aspects that you're seeing emphasising the things that imply guilt. And if that remains the case and the balance of evidence isn't properly reported, then the mainstream media are lighting a fuse under this case. And when that fuse goes off, you will have to imagine that they will be nodding sagely at the riots that follow and saying things like, well, you have to understand why they're so angry. I'd like to be wrong about that, by the way. Meanwhile, Joe Biden continues to show all the signs of being an old man in a hurry by announcing a slate of gun control actions and facing up to the Second Amendment arguments by plainly dismissing them. He said this, Nothing I'm about to recommend in any way impinges on the Second Amendment. These are phony arguments suggesting that these are Second Amendment rights at stake from what we're talking about. But no amendment to the Constitution is absolute. From the very beginning, you couldn't own any weapon that you wanted to own. From the very beginning, the Second Amendment existed. Certain people weren't allowed to have weapons. From a historical point of view, there's a lot in what he's saying here. The originalist claim that the Second Amendment was intended in the way that it's currently talked about is incredibly weak on the evidence. Nevertheless, Biden will know that this is a highly provocative move given the current tension in US politics. And you can only think that he's come to this conclusion because he's evidently frail, 
He knows this is his one shot. Forget the nonsense he was saying about intending to stand again in 2024. I don't believe that he thinks that for a moment. He's thinking, this is the last job I am going to do before I'm retired at best. So what have I got to lose? Let's try to do as many of the hard things that we've always wanted to do, but never dared to. And he's been clear that after some relatively minor measures he can pass quickly, he wants Congress to pass bills ultimately to go for banning assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. There's no reason, he said, that a person would need a weapon that can hold a hundred rounds. Now, as I've said before, I'm a Brit. I don't much care what you do with your guns in America. I think you're nicely kind of weird by putting as much importance on them as you do. But it's also the case that being highly confrontational on the issue is going to be divisive. And while that might be worth it, if it actually cut America's appalling violent death record, there's actually no reason to think it's going to make the slightest difference on that score. Still, it means that American politics will stay interesting for a while. But I thought the whole point of electing Biden was that you wanted it to be boring for a while. Clearly not the strategy that they've actually settled on. On the plus side, at least you'll still get some gloriously sunny days in the summer to cheer the heart and gladden the soul. And even more so because the Scopex plan to dim the sun by injecting probably calcium carbonate into the stratosphere, that has had a major setback this week. If you saw my video on this project, you'll remember that this was a plan to reduce the impact of global warming by filtering out some of the incoming sunlight in order to reduce average global temperatures. Unsurprisingly, it's somewhat controversial. The plan's proponents argue that all they want to do at this stage is to work out the practicalities of whether it could be safely made to work. So if we need to do it in the future, then we'll know how to. Well, it turns out that it's so controversial, people won't let them do that. They won't allow them to fly the balloon, even if they don't release anything. Sweden's space agency, which was going to host the first exploratory phase, has basically pulled the plug after being targeted by campaigners. And you have to say, this project is a dead man walking. The immediate and intuitive reaction of so many people is to conclude that it's crazy and probably dangerous. You just won't get the consent of the world even to take those first steps. Because the simple fact of working out how to do something creates the momentum that ultimately leads you to go ahead and do it. There was nothing remotely dangerous about the trial flight. It was, in effect, a balloon flight. Even so, enormous opposition because people are not stupid about where this thing ultimately leads. And finally, the actual most significant piece of news this week, which nevertheless gets relegated to the last item. Particle physicists say that they have found strong evidence for a new kind of physics and potentially an entirely new force of nature. A type of subatomic particle called muons has been shown to behave differently in a magnetic field than the accepted laws of physics would predict. This is the latest indication that the standard model of physics is not correct. It already can't account for gravity and dark matter and the latest findings imply that only a new physics in the form of particles or forces could explain them. It's a reminder that however smart we think we are, ultimately we're only really smart enough to know what we don't know. Now, in a minute, we'll reply to comments and move on to the final thought for the week. But first, I had some good feedback from the recent Q&A video, but it's time we had this month's go without a safety net. That's right, it's time for another live stream. Are we talking about some of the topical issues of a moment, especially some of the things that are really interesting but can't find their way into this sort of roundup news video? I'll be taking questions live if you have them, I may even be asking your opinion about future plans for this channel. So join me for that, live and unfiltered, at 7pm UK time, next Wednesday, 14th of April. See you there. I had a critical comment on the Is Britain Racist video, looking at the recent Sewell report. It was too long to feature in its entirety, but a couple of the key jabs. Mallon considers the furore over Sewell's unfortunate characterisation of Caribbean slavery to be completely irrelevant to the report's substance and opts to say no more. No, it isn't irrelevant. Even if badly worded, the passage betrays a horrifyingly dismissive attitude to black experience and the enormity of the episode's toxic legacy. Do 
You know how we know something is completely irrelevant to a report? If a single paragraph that deals with the subject, if it had been missed out, would it have affected the integrity and the substance of the rest of the report? And the answer is no, it wouldn't have. The topics dealt with in the report, education, crime and policing, health, all of those were about the current situation. What are the influences on differential outcomes where they exist? Was there evidence of systemic racism? None of that substance was affected in the slightest if you had removed that paragraph. As Sewell said, what he said in that paragraph wasn't intended by him to be read in the way that a number of the critics did. Now, does intent matter? in communication? Surely it should. So that's why I decided not to focus on it, because the substance of the report was the important work. This phrase about a dismissive attitude to black experience is not helpful. Sewell's comment was about how people are taught to regard themselves as people that have been part of an evolving set of traditions, or alternatively as the inheritors of indelible victimhood. And that's an argument about what will serve people's interest best today, in terms of their self-image. It's essentially about whether victim culture is good for the people that have it foist on them as youngsters. There's a serious discussion to be had there, but none of it is about the almost exclusively black members of the Commission dismissing black experience. This comment then raised the recent example of the tragedy of the Grenfell Tower block fire, which for non-UK viewers, a tower block which had inflammable cladding on the outside of the building, which caught fire, became a massive blaze causing many deaths and whose inhabitants were largely from ethnic minorities. Grenfell got one fleeting mention and the implication from the rest of the report is that the imbalance was down to social rather than ethnic disadvantage. But why were minorities so overrepresented in that exceptionally deadly manifestation of supposedly non-racial disadvantage? I understand why people whose position is that every racial disparity is due to racism would make the claim, as they do, that the Grenfell disaster was about racism. I don't wholly understand the rationale. I mean, it was about poverty, for sure. It was low-cost accommodation which attracted people on limited budgets and the owners of such accommodation are going to be incentivised to cut corners because their margins are thin and many, but not all, landlords for those sorts of properties are not the most ethical. Why do you need more than that? London has a higher percentage of ethnic minorities. A number of them work in lower-paying jobs for reasons that are indeed explored in the report. So why wouldn't a block like this have a higher percentage of ethnic minorities than some other blocks located in some different places? And this is the whole point of the report. Would we have avoided Grenfell with policies specifically targeting ethnic minorities? Or, in that case, would the appropriate response be that that cladding material should not be used on any buildings, period, regardless of the ethnicity of those that are living there? If you care about the suffering of those victims, you owe it to them, even if they don't themselves see it this way, to identify the real causes and to tackle them properly. That's what I thought was the message of the Sewell report. And it still seems like a, at least a reasonable good faith argument. How do we stop being snowflakes? I mean, seriously, this week it was members of parliament who called for the measurement system, the Body Mass Index, BMI, to be scrapped because it could trigger eating disorders and has become justification for body shaming. The BMI, if you're not familiar with it, is a calculation relating your weight adjusted for your height. As a simple system, it's not perfect, but it tells you roughly whether you're normal weight or overweight or obese or clinically obese. The point is just how remarkable this message is. It's not arguing the system should be scrapped because it's inaccurate. No, no, it's not that. It's that a number of people can't handle being told the truth about their body status. Now, that's a problem in itself. There is real suffering if people develop eating disorders, but what's the winning approach here? To decide as a society that we should hide reality because we're now incapable of coping with hard truths? Or should it be to train ourselves to become more robust in the face of unwelcome facts? It's hard to lose weight and stigmatising people who are overweight doesn't help. 
The cruelty of the social media age likewise doesn't help. That cruelty is also a sign of self-indulgence, by the way. It's arguably all connected. But in the past, people suffered much greater adversity and came through it mentally tougher. A heroic age where you didn't need trigger warnings on Disney movies. Do you know how you make a muscle stronger? You stress it almost beyond endurance and then it recovers stronger. Our world, obsessed with safety, obsessed with avoiding mental stress, obsessed with so-called microaggressions, it has been all about the definition of improving life by avoiding adversity. Rather than focusing on being the best we can, training ourselves for strength and resilience, we've focused instead on being comfortable. Does that mean that we're all trapped in the standards of our age? Can you make a virtue of self-discipline in an age that sneers at such ideas as it tucks into a second double cheeseburger with fries? I think you can, but it's harder than you would think. Mind you, that's the point. Expecting it to be easy has kind of been the problem. Stepping back from the brink means holding on to our identity as a society that can still speak uncomfortable truths and then decide what to do about them. And the uncomfortable truth is that we've become enfeebled and we're now debating whether to abolish any language that might disturb us with the evidence of our enfeeblement. We still have a choice, or at least it would benefit us if we behave as though we do, because otherwise, by definition, we don't. Now, one of the choices I have on this channel is to choose what to talk about. I knew that talking about Britain and racism last week would get that video demonetized at least for a while before it got reviewed by a human being, and so it was. And probably then choosing that topic for the replying to comments section on this video will probably achieve the same once again. I'm able to do that because of the support that people give this channel on Patreon. Not only does it enable me to talk about issues that YouTube might consider too controversial to show adverts next to, but which nevertheless are the important and interesting topics that we most want to talk about, it also enables me to put the time in to produce free videos per week especially when quite a few of those videos require a significant amount of research. If you would like to add your support to the independent, fact-focused and non-ideological content that I aim to produce on this channel, please go to patreon.com forward slash Malin Baker. It is always appreciated. Either way, have a great week. My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show.